do a series called Brilliant in the Basics that we come back to things that are part of the fabric of who we are as Christians and who we are as a church. And t for a couple of weeks, we're going to blend the two. There's a letter Paul writes to Timothy in First and Second Timothy, and this letter is a little bit different from the other letters Paul writes. And the reason why it's different is that it's not written to a group of people, but to a person. It's written to Timothy. Timothy was one of the spiritual leaders in the city of Ephesus, and what Paul does, he writes to him to let him know how he should direct the church in a way that it will accomplish what God would have him accomplish, and that's what makes it a little bit different. We're going to look at a passage, and I'm going to talk about it. J.C. Chambers is going to talk about it, been in the leadership team of hope from the beginning, and what we want you to know is we think about going from this place into another facility. We want to be able to guide, to, to reflect a little bit with you about where hope has come from and why we make the choices that we make and what will continue to be true of us if we go to another facility or we stay because it's just part of what we understand to be what God wants us to say. So with that in mind, look what it says. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. I'm going to talk for a little bit about half the time. JC is going to come up then, and, and we're both going to take a swing at this. Paul writes, so do not be ashamed, and again, writing to Timothy, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and who has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Again, Paul writes to Timothy to tell him how to discharge his leadership responsibilities in the city of Ephesus, and what he ends up saying to him is about what Jesus' mission was. And he, he goes in and, and gives him what was Jesus' mission, and we see a couple things. Look what it says in verse 9, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has, and here it is, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. If we put a couple things up there, Jesus' mission was to destroy death and to bring life and immortality to light, or to turn off death and to turn on life. Um, before time began, God determined that eternal life would be an unearned gift rather than an earned reward. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Here's what that means. God was not surprised by the fall. This was not something that happened. He goes, oh, I didn't see that coming. Jesus was to be the Savior before time began, before sin, before there was a garden for Adam and Eve or the serpent to enter into before there was a world that would hold that garden before anything existed. God determined this. Anybody who experiences eternal existence with God will do so because it's an unearned gift rather than an earned reward. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So, God already had this stuff in place, and I think what it means then is that Jesus wasn't a divine afterthought. Before the creation of the world, God purposed that his son would destroy death and bring life and immortality to life. I guess here's what this means. It's kind of strange. Before death was created, death's terminator had already been dispatched. Can we say that? Grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, which destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light. That's why God was going to send him. And before death even existed, God commissioned his son to destroy death and bring life and immortality to light.
He came to turn off death. Look what it says. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of sin, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. There's a progression here. Law, sin, death. One, two, three. Law comes first. When there's a do this and you'll be loved, you'll be cursed, this is step one, leads to step two, sin, which leads to death. Law, sin, and death. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is law. So if you want to remove death's sting, what do you do? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is law. If you want to remove the sting of death, what do you deal with? Law. Law. Because that's step one. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Look what it says. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. What it seems to say, this might seem kind of weird, but when the dust cleared, and you look at the, the cross, I was raised Catholic, and Jesus is still on the cross in Catholic churches. I was with Bible study early on. I was telling about a story. I'll make this quick. We uh, walked into a church, and the church I grew up in, my sister was getting married, so my son at the time, Gavin, was three. And Jesus is on the cross, suspended over the altar. And there was a wedding rehearsal going on, and our wedding rehearsal was next. But we were supposed to be very quiet. <laughs> so we get in the back of the church, and, and Gavin yells out, Hey, Dad, look, Jesus is flying! It's kind of suspended up there. Uh, Jesus is, is on, on, the, on the cross. Um, when the dust cleared, though, Jesus wasn't on the cross. He rose. You know what it says? The, cross, the law was nailed to the cross. Here's what happened. You know what Jesus came for? To repeal old covenant law and replace it with new covenant. And the difference between the old covenant and the new is pretty, pretty amazing. Old covenant is if you obey, you'll be blessed. If you disobey, you'll be cursed. The new covenant is there's no ifs. No ifs. There's no curses, just blessings. And what's left is to believe it. That's what Jesus came to do. Um, the law was nailed to the cross, and the new covenant re... And in nailing that to the cross, look what it says... In the last verse, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That's the devil. And free all those, those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You know what this says? The fear of death is an enslaving force. Listen to me. It talks about those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You know why Jesus came? To turn off death. Now, we die physically. But what he wants us to understand is although death will be, death is not fun. But the sting of death is being eternally removed from God. And that's what Jesus came to remove, to remove the fear of death. The fear of death is an enslaving force, not just because we're afraid to die, but we're afraid of what happens on the far side of death. Would you agree with me? What's it going to be? Is it going to be dark and cold? Are we going to be alone, being tortured, frightened, in dark places? Jesus came to say, no. He came to destroy death and bring life and immortality to light. Destroy means to render an operative. Jesus came to turn off death and to turn on life. Immortal life in the Old Testament, it's not very clear. There's a couple 
faint allusions to eternal life in the Old Testament, one in Job. Mostly what you'll find in the Old Testament, people believing, once you go into the ground, that's it. David said, from the ground, I'm not going to praise you. Job says, I know that I'll, my Redeemer lives and I will see him, but there's just vague, vague understandings of eternal life. You know what happens with Jesus? It's like this veil over eternal existence. So you couldn't really see it in the Old Testament. And you know what Jesus did? He went, let me show you this. And you know what he opens up? Eternal life. That's why in the Old Testament, earthly blessings eclipse eternal blessings. That's in the Old Testament. Earthly blessings eclipse eternal blessings. The New Testament, whoosh, eternal blessings eclipse temporal blessings. That's why we understand this side of the cross, we're not going to get a great life now. We're not going to always get the parking spot right in front of Walmart. We're not always going to get a million dollars. You check with us a hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's when we get what we so eternal eclipses earthly. Um, immortal life is revealed in the New Testament. Look what it says, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God, not that we're competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. Our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Here's what this seems to say, and now I'm going to make a couple points of application. Quick, I'm going to bring JC up. The letter of the old covenant kills. That's what it says. Listen to what I'm saying. When we believe, and we want to understand the difference between the old covenant and the new, when we still believe we live under the letter of the law, it kills spiritual existence. That's what it says here. Look what it, the letter kills. The Spirit gives life. The Spirit is the Spirit of the new covenant. And that's what God would have us understand. The difference between old and new, competence means kind of able to attain the goal. Um, so, two applications, two words of application. Um, it says in the verse, guard the good deposit that was entrusted you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. From a leadership perspective, what I understand is this. The good deposit, now you are really great people, but you're not the deposit. We're not supposed to guard you. I know you're great, you're wonderful, yeah, I know but you're not the deposit. The deposit is the message. And what it says, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. You know what he gives us? He gives us a message. And he says, here's what you're supposed to do from a leadership perspective. Guard this. Don't let it be changed. Don't let it be distorted. Do the best you can to take this thing in its pristine form and present it because we're competent as ministers of a new covenant. You take this new covenant gospel, you say it, you explain it, and you benefit when it's guarded. That's what it seems to be saying here. And you know what that means? You understand this. I'm not, I'm naturally, leaders aren't responsible for your spirituality. You understand this because God has entrusted you, God has entrusted his message to all of us. And as we keep focused on the new covenant, it will change you. It takes time. We tend to mix things up. We think the letter still applies in the spirit. We get caught. You keep coming back. We'll talk about this all the time. Why? Because it's what's been trusted to us and it's what we're supposed to do. Um, what you've learned from me, keep it the pattern of sound teaching. You know what Paul said? Here's what he said. Okay, what I write, he says to Timothy, you focus on this stuff. Now, if we do this, we're going to do a couple of things. I'll be very direct. Um, what you don't do, if you take this seriously, when Paul says, what you've heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, if you do that, 
You will not scare the hell into people to get them to make a conversion to Christ. You just won't do it. You know why? Because Paul doesn't do it. How many times does Paul mention hell in his letters? How many times? Ten? Over ten? Five to ten? Zero to five? How about zero? Paul never mentions hell in his letters. Now, and as the pattern of sound teaching, you know what that tells me? That if we're going to do that, we don't hang the specter of hell over somebody's head to get them to convert because Paul didn't. And that's why we're not going to do that. Now, you know, I'm, I'm kind of throwing up, and I'm not saying people are bad. It's what happened at LifeLight. And 100,000 people heard a message that scared the hell into them. And can God cause that to work for good? Can he? Yeah. Is it the best way to do things? Is it the way Paul did things? The answer is no. If we're going to keep the pattern of sound teaching, we're not going to do it. Why? Because we're smarter? No, because it's not what he did. It's, he doesn't tell us to do that. What are we going to do? We're going to major on the new covenant. Why? Because we, he's made us competent. Come on up, Jack. He's made us competent as messengers of a new covenant. Here's what that means. Come on. <laughs> I'll just kind of bridge him up here. Uh, it's why we'll talk about belief, and we have and will continue to focus on belief because that's what the new covenant focuses us on. And it says as we do that, seeing that will enable us to become who he wants us to be. That's the deposit that was given to us. JC's going to pick up and, and say a few more things from a leadership perspective. Come on, Jay. I want to, can you hear me? I want to first uh, talk about this board. <laughs> Jumping Jack zero, Blurpees 15, Mount Climbers 25, Sitting Farts 20. <laughs> and then there's a creature up here. I'm sorry, Mike, your message is compelling, but I'm a little ADD. I was paying attention to this. <laughs> so Timothy has challenged us to, to uh, hold and guard the deposit. My job is to do a little bit of history real quick. Some of you don't know, 17 years ago, we ran in a week's time from one church to another. And I'm not telling you this to bring back ghosts or woe is us. For 50 to 65 people that left the church that we fundamentally believed in and we fundamentally believed in the leadership and because of all kinds of controversy at the church um, our leaders was asked to dismantle the leadership team and so 65 of us huddled in a house and decided that we wanted to support the message. And we wanted to support the message and we wanted to keep the messenger. We didn't know how we was going to do it. We didn't have 300000 or we have now $110,000 in the bank. We didn't have that. We had 65 people with empty pockets. And in a week's time, we were standing in the sanctuary of O'Gorman High School. We had 65 people. We had a building that we could use. We had a minister and his wife who we believed was presenting the gospel the way we believed it. 
and we had a bald head musician who could sing his tail off and play his tail off, and he led worship all by himself. And for a few years, we operated like an underground church full of shame, and that became the pressure, the tension. When, Paul, when Timothy's writing, the church was under assault. There were things happening, and people were questioning why and how and what. Well, when we got together and we decided to call this Hope Community Church, we decided to commit ourselves to one simple thing. We were going to teach and dispense the message. And with God's authority, we sought to teach not what we knew, but what we thought was God's biblical truth about his grace. And we continued that. The shame that we carried with us didn't maim or destroy us like it was intended to do anybody. It bound us together. It made us committed to one thing. We even more fervently decided we were going to teach one thing, preach one thing, dispense one thing, gather for one thing, sing about one thing. And that was God's grace and God's grace to his creation and God's grace, grace to all his people. So we had this new building prospect. And there's rumblings as if we haven't been doing church. I hear people outside hope saying, now what are they going to do? They got a home now. You can, ba, 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 ba. People who don't go here. Like we ain't been doing church already. This ain't going to change. It says guard the message. Here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to broaden our focus. We're not going to start doing, not that they're not good. We're not going to start doing Awana and ba, ba, ba. We're going to do what we always been doing. We're not going to start teaching purpose-driven life and, and Willow Creek and we're going to keep on the path of God's commitment to you because we believe that is the deposit that was given us. We're not going to chase the trends. We never have. We're not going to. We're also, we're not going to guard, the, we're not going to broaden our focus, and we're also not going to guard the building just because we have one. Now we have to deal with if the roof leaks, it's our problem. But we're not guarding that. We're not going to guard church growth. We're not going to start looking at the numbers, seeing if the numbers support the building. That means we're not going to start doing programs just to get people into church. We're not going to guard your spiritual development. Never have. We're not going to start now. We're going to challenge you to a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Creator, understanding that the Father loves you with everything He has. And if you get that, your growth and development will change. But it's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to put the message out there. Your responsibility is to battle your own demons so that you can begin to understand the message clearer. And what God says is he will equip you with the Holy Spirit who actually will battle your demons for you. Simple thing is we have to remain and hold We're not going to now assume we're a church. We've always been a church. But we're not going to focus on membership. So for some of, some of the folks who've talked to me outside church says, well, 
I heard you guys don't have membership, as if not having membership is a function of being portable. No, we're not going to have membership at New Haven either. It's not what God called us to do. He didn't call us to focus on the grass. He didn't call us to focus on the roof. He didn't call us to focus on programs. He called us to focus and guard the deposit. So, folks, understand, we're going to keep doing Hope Community Church the way we've been doing it, in a building. What we will focus on, what you can count on practically, is that we will continue to develop materials and teaching series and Bible studies that help you articulate deeply the understanding of the Father's commitment to you through the Old Testament writings and the New Testament writings, focusing on though the New Covenant understanding of those writings. What we will also commit is to develop materials and teaching series and opportunities for you to continue to be students of the gospel of grace, guarding its truth and studying it through your own lives in the scriptures. And thirdly, we will commit to developing materials and programs and opportunities to help you and I be able to discern, to be able to sort out faith that's driven by a clear understanding of God's commitment to us and the security in that because we believe that's the important thing. That can affect your marriage. That can affect your work. That can affect your parenting. That can affect you as a kid. That can affect you at college. That can affect you at high school. Do you understand what we're talking about? God's commitment to you is radical. No other religion says God does the work. Christianity is the only one that says God meets you where you're at and clears the way so that love can knock on the door of your heart. And then, if you've got drinking, drugging, lying, division, deception, God will begin to expose, illuminate, the Scripture says in Ephesians. When light shines on it in the loving, gentle way, whatever it shines on starts to glow, and you can see it for what it is. You can't do that if you're afraid of hell, and you can't do that if you're afraid of God. So we will major on helping you distinguish faith driven by security in the knowing that God's committed to you versus faith driven by trying hard to keep your promises to God, trying hard to appease God and make Him smile, trying hard to offer God smoke and seed and grain offerings of your life in order to get the blessings to rain down, as some evangelists would say. The blessings rain down whether you send smoke up or not because we serve a God who loves us for free. But I'm telling you, some of the things that come with the trappings of church, we ain't doing and never have, and we're not going to start. The other thing you need to understand is that we operate from an elder model, which means there's, we don't do church votes on purpose. We don't want you to have to worry about that stuff. We have five or six or seven elders whose job is to mingle, find out what's going on, and we make corporate decisions. We make the decisions. That's why even moving to New Haven wasn't something we asked. We prayed about it. We asked God about it and waited 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 and waited. Eighteen years later, we're saying we finally have a home. <laughs> yeah. 
We, we're, not, we're not putting that on you. So decisions about the grass and how the, uh, how the sanctuary is going to look, guess what? Ain't going to be your decision. Ain't going to be your decision. We have a committee of folks who that's their job. They'll take care of that. What we want to say to you is we want you to keep coming, knowing we're not going to change in New Haven. We want you to keep coming, knowing the cringe value is not going up. We want you to keep coming because God is still on the throne and he's still committed to us. He loves us. He sees us, all that stuff. He deals with us gently and he's big enough to get us through this move. The question is, here's the question. When I uh, was asked to take leadership over a stronghold, I asked all my people a question, and I meant it. I said, um, there was two founding members of stronghold. Now there's going to be one. I'm buying the practice, and, I'm, and I have a direction that I think God has given me. Are you on board? And I said to 16 people, one hour at a time, are you on board? Because if you're not, cool, I'll help you find work, but I'm going this way, and if, I'm going this way. And if you can't go with me, make that decision. We ain't going to have a dysfunctional disagreement. Let's decide to part as adults. And I'm saying to you as one of the members of the leadership team, our mission is still the same. We're going this way. We're going south. Are you with me? I can't hear you. Are you with me? Okay. And we're not going. We're not going the church route. We're not going to become this place. That place on Western Avenue will become a warehouse, not a church, where the message will be dispensed in 18 bazillion different ways. And if we grow, cool. But more importantly, if the message goes out broader, more frequently, more often to more people, do you know that the message is in China? Did you know there was a conversation on an airplane for one of the folks here? The Ten Commitments is in Georgia. Did you know there are people in, there's a core of people in Rapid City that listen to our, our sermons? and download our stuff. Did you know that? So don't get fooled by looking around the numbers and going, oh, geez, the numbers today is small. Forget that. The message is going out. We will continue to do it that way. And the way we do church is the way we do church. It's not going to change. Amen? All right. Worship team, come up. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word and for entrusting it. We really do desire to prize it as being precious. We don't distort it in order to try to make it say what we want it to say. We try to reflect what it says. You're really smart. You know what you're doing. You know what catalyzes spiritual life, and that's the things you say. So we want to say that and continue to Speak yourself out to us and through us to those you would reach. We want to be your servants. We want to be able to get there one day. And here you say, well done, good and faithful servant. You kept the deposit that was entrusted to you. You gave it to one another and you spread it out. That's what you're supposed to do. Really looking forward to hearing that. So help us to that end, all of us, in Jesus' name. Amen.